At some point now, and inevitably in the future, we are going to see more and more instances of extreme snowfalls despite the ever-growing influence of global warming. To those with a vested interest in delaying the implementation of proactive policies to start reducing the rate of greenhouse emissions, this increase in snowfall is highlighted and shouted from rooftops as evidence for the absence of global warming and climate change. It does certainly seem plausible, after all we associate cold temperatures with ice and subsequently snow, so lots of snow must mean colder climate. This is of course not the case, and the culprit is our weakening jet stream. The global climate system is an immensely complex entity with hundreds of different variables that can influence how our weather manifests itself. It's actually a relatively recent development in human history that we have the computing power to actually model and predict how different conditions can influence local weather systems. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Essentially, all weather comes from imbalances in air temperature and how the corresponding air masses interact with one another. But the caveat of that secret is that changes in air temperature correspond to changes to multiple different properties in the air. So let's figure out why we are seeing more intense snowfalls. We imagine two different air masses. We'll heat one up and cool the other. As a result, they increase and decrease in volume respectively. If we look up here, there's a lot more air molecules for the warmer air than for the cooler air. Since there are more air molecules in this box versus this box, we can say this air mass exhibits high pressure at this altitude. Because this higher pressure zone is next to a lower pressure zone, the air molecules naturally migrate to this volume over the cooler air mass. As they do this, the heated air mass underneath rises to take its place and we create a cycle of warm air rising and moving to the lower pressure region over the cooler air mass. These two air masses represent the corresponding air over the temperate and polar regions, and similarly like we just saw, the warmer air masses like to rise and then move to the higher altitudes over the cooler regions. Now, because the Earth is a rotating sphere, this air that travels towards the poles has excess horizontal velocity compared to other points at similar longitudes. As a result, this causes the air to deflect in the direction of Earth's rotation as it moves towards the poles. This phenomenon is called the Coriolis effect, and it's responsible for the creation of the jet stream. There are actually four jet streams, but only the two polar jet streams have the strength to heavily impact our weather and climate, and the northern polar jet stream is affected more by global warming than the southern polar jet stream. But why? Normally the poles of our planet are very cold. Their high latitudes means even though they receive more annual sunlight than anywhere else on the globe, the angle at which the rays from the sun impact their surface is much shallower than any other place on Earth. This causes a lot of solar radiation to reflect off the surface and reduces the energy density. If we imagine a square meter of energy flux in space and then map its impact at the poles, we can see it's less dense and more spread out, thus less energy is absorbed by the Earth. Because the temperature in our atmosphere is dictated by the temperature of the Earth's surface, if the Earth's surface isn't able to absorb a lot of radiation from the sun, well then it can't significantly heat up the atmosphere. Therefore, we have a really cold climate at the poles. This temperature difference between the temperate and polar regions creates the pressure gradients that drives the creation of polar jet streams. A greater difference in temperature creates a stronger pressure gradient which causes moving air masses to migrate further either from the temperate region or towards the poles. And because of the Coriolis effect, the further they can migrate, the faster these air masses will move horizontally and subsequently the faster the jet stream will become. The faster something moves, the greater its momentum, and the greater an object's momentum, the harder it is to accelerate or change its path of motion. So, in other words, the faster the jet stream is moving, the more stable it is, and the driving force dictating how fast the jet stream moves is the temperature difference between the temperate and polar regions. So global warming is decreasing this temperature gradient, but why would that happen? Strangely enough, it's because the change in global temperature is not homogenous or equal throughout the entire globe. Although the world has seen an average global temperature increase of 0.8 degrees Celsius since 1880, the Arctic's average temperature is 2.3 degrees warmer since 1970, a shockingly noticeable amount. But what causes this imbalance in heating? There are three driving forces causing this imbalance. The first is the storage of heat energy is easier in cooler objects. Blackbody radiation is the cause of both the heating and cooling of our world, and it's very dependent on the temperature of the emitter. This means small increases in temperature means a very large increase in emitted energy. And it also means if we supply the same energy flux to two different systems with two different temperatures, the cooler system will see a bigger impact on its temperature. Therefore, with the increasing constant flux of energy we are seeing with the greenhouse effect, the poles heat up faster due to their lower temperatures. 
The second reason for faster warming at the poles are feedback loops. As I mentioned earlier, the poles have a large zenith angle with the sun, which makes it difficult to absorb solar radiation. This is compounded by reflective surfaces like snow and ice, but as temperatures warm up and snow and ice melts, the reflectiveness or albedo of the poles decreases, allowing them to absorb more solar radiation and thus warm up. This creates a positive feedback loop, where melting ice increases absorbed radiation, which melts more ice, and so on and so on. The third primary reason for polar warming is also why we see such a disproportionate amount of warming between the Arctic and the Antarctic, the ocean's currents. Of the extra heat that is now being contained within the Earth's system, 90% of it is being stored in the oceans. Unlike the Antarctic, Arctic ice is floating on top of the ocean with no solid ground beneath it. This puts roughly all of the ice mass in contact with ocean waters. Not only does the warmer ocean water aid in slowing the refreezing of ice during the winter, but both the Gulf Stream and Norwegian Current bring warm water from the tropics up to the Arctic, further exacerbating this process. It is this ocean circulation which is causing the faster degradation of the Arctic ice compared to that of Antarctica. So now that we see that the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the world, we can see how the temperature gradient from the temperate to Arctic regions is weakening and thus the jet stream slows down. This is an issue because normally the jet stream acts kind of like a barrier, so if a low pressure system starts to move south, it will bump into it and be pushed to the east. This continual process produces what we call the polar vortex. However, with a slower jet stream, that means it's less stable because it has less momentum. Now if a low pressure system from the Arctic heads south, instead of being bumped east like it should, it may be able to push its way further south than before. As a result, we get a fast influx of cold Arctic air, which is certainly colder than the temperate air's dew point. What exactly does that mean? Well, warmer air can hold more water vapor than cooler air. So if we take an air mass with a relative humidity of, say, about 60% and rapidly cool it down, then the cooler air mass no longer has the energy to maintain all that water in its gaseous form. This causes the excess to condense into liquid or solid if it's cold enough. So as a cold snap from the Arctic rapidly condenses the moisture in the temperate air mass, this newly condensed water becomes a lot of snow. Now to recap what we've learned. Differences in the temperate and polar air masses creates a high altitude pressure gradient. As the air masses move from high to low pressure, they gain horizontal velocity due to the Coriolis effect and create what we call the jet stream. The jet stream normally acts like a bumper to low pressure systems, but as it slows down, its ability to deflect weakens and thus cold low pressure systems are more easily able to migrate into temperate regions causing havoc. So remember, if it ever feels like life just dropped a meter of snow on the metropolitan area overnight crippling transport and emergency systems, contact your local representative and tell them you prefer sustainability over short term luxury.